Hi, thanks for listening to my talk. My name is Daniel Mogimi and I'm a PhD student at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Today I'm going to talk about my work on microarchitectural attacks. Medusa microarchitectural data leakage via automated attack synthesis is a joint work with Moritz Lieb, Berg Sunar, and Michael Schwartz. In a meltdown attack, the attacker tries to access a kernel memory address from the user space. We always knew that doing this through a safe fault exception, so we cannot do that in any real application. But people later on figured out that this memory access has some microarchitectural footprints in the CPU. Therefore, in a meltdown attack, we allocate some memory that is backed by the CPU cache lines. And in the first step of this attack, we access this kernel address that we are not supposed to access to. When we perform this memory access, the secret data from the kernel will be stored in some internal CPU registers. And then in the second step, we execute another memory operation, which, which acts as an encoding gadget and encodes the secret kernel data to some CPU cache line. Then we get an exception, but the cache line is already modified. So in the third step of this attack, we can use a technique called flash and reload to look into the cache lines and see which one has been accessed. What happened after the meltdown? Meltdown was fixed on some microarchitectures like Coffee Lake and Castle Lake, but people found out you can still leak some data. And this time, it doesn't even matter what is the exact address of this memory operation that you access. And as far as this memory operation uh, faces an assist or an exception, you see that some data is leaked from the CPU. There are so many different variants of this, this new, new attacks called microarchitectural data sampling that leak data from different buffers. And by leaking data from different buffers, you can compromise the security of other processes and applications. If you look at the memory operations on an x86 machine, we realize that the number of conditions and things CPU need to check is kind of exhaustive. For example, the CPU need to check if a memory address is actually correct, and then the CPU has to translate this address with the help of a translation look-aside look buffer. And if this address has a correct TLB entry, then uh, the permissions need to be checked, and there are some metadata and mappings that need to be checked. And there are so many things that need to be checked until a memory operation actually uh, perform correctly. So there are too many things to test if you want to test if a CPU is vulnerable to an MDS attack. And uh, based on also on the experience we had with uh, trying these attacks, we know that uh, reproducing these attacks is generally not very reliable. Sometimes by modifying the proof of concept a little bit and massaging the pipeline, uh, the the proof of concept changes, it leaks from different buffers, and there are so many different CPU configurations nowadays, sometimes uh, something may work, may not work, and there is there is no public tool to test all these, uh, even if you want to test uh, new hardware, we don't know uh, how many things to test. In addition to that, it's hard to quantify the impact of these attacks because some POCs may leak on one system, not the other, and the leakage rate of this POC is also generally not very clear. And the transinter tool is supposed to actually solve some of these problems. So we mentioned that Meltdown has three steps. Uh, so instead of a step one, we're going to replace this step one by a randomly generated memory operation. To achieve this, we take those conditions that we discussed earlier and try to mix and match them randomly to generate a new memory access that is either faulty or it faces a microcode assist or an exotic condition. We also generate other memory instructions before this uh, first step that puts data into different microarchitectural buffers and into the pipeline. And to do this, we again generate different memory operations randomly. And these memory operations, of course, they put known data to the, uh, to the pipeline. So later on, we can find out if any of those data has been leaked. We also add some random instruction because, as we mentioned, sometimes uh, adding some random instruction or removing some instructions in the proof of concept may actually change the leakage behavior. This is how transistor gen generate random code snippets with the hope of reproducing a variant of these attacks or even finding new variants. Uh, after generating each of these code snippets, we execute the snippet and look if there is a leakage. And if there is a leakage, of one of the known values that we have filled in the pipeline, then if you are interested to look more closely in the code snippet, then uh, we say, okay, this is the MDS POC probably, and then we try to classify the leakage with the help of performance counters or just 
manual analysis and, and playing with the proof of concept. Uh, we tested this tool on multiple CPUs and generated tons of POCs, and some of these POCs can be found in the source code repository that we just released. And uh, we looked at also in more closely to some of these POCs, and there is a um, there is a more detailed discussion of them in the paper, uh, but uh, this helped us to give a better insight into these attacks. We, and we noticed that some of the assumptions about these attacks in previous papers are not necessarily valid. Uh, for example, we previously assumed that leakage from the store buffer require 4K aliasing, but transitor generated some POCs that leak data from the store buffer without 4K aliasing. Uh, so with this analysis, we also found a new subvariant of uh, the subvariant of these attacks. We called it uh, Medusa. Medusa only leaks data uh, from write combining operation, and there are some operations on Intel CPUs that are inherently performing in a write combining fashion. The advantage of Medusa compared to a previous attack is that since it only leaks a specific operation, it has less noise. For example, if you run a whole application on a hyperthread, you won't leak all the memory operations you don't care about. You only leak memory copy operation. So you may be able to do a more targeted attack with the help of Medusa. Uh, we came up with three variants of Medusa that uh, each of them trigger the leakage differently. In the first variant, we leak the right combining operation by, the, by indexing into different offsets of a cache line, uh, for instance. And by doing uh, some experiments, we realized that some offsets of a cache line leak data from the uh, rep move that is running on the other hyperthread. And uh, we also realized that we don't leak anything that is after this 32 byte. And our hypothesis is that this has to do with something with the size of the, the common data bytes that is 32 byte on Intel CPUs. Uh, in the second variant, we leaked the repo from the other hyperthread by doing an un online memory store to load forwarding. For example, if we do a faulty memory load that is 32 byte here, and before that, faulty load, we do a memory server operation that is not faulty, but is a smaller, with a different index. And we realize that the data from the rep move is, is leaked here. And But more interestingly, we realize that also if you change the offset of this store operation that is totally unrelated, you can um, you, you manage to leak different offset, offsets of the rep move that is running on the other uh, hyperthread. And the third variant of this attack just use the rep move operation again, uh, but uh, this faulty rep move basically leaks the data from the other rep move, which we call this a shadow rep move variant, because it seems like the buffer is shared between these two rep move operations running on separate threads, and the one that gets a fault pick up a stale data that is put there by the other one sometime. And uh, we also wanted to show the impact of this new variant on a real attack scenario. So we demonstrated an attack that leaks an RSA key from OpenSSL. OpenSSL uses a base64 decoder to load uh, cryptography keys that are stored in PEM format, and base64 decoder use repmove instruction. So then we executed one of the variants of our attack. We realized that some part of this encoded key is leaked more often, and it always leaked the same parts. Medusa leaks 60 byte chunks of continuous data, which uh, when we looked at the decoded RSA key, each of these 60 byte, 16 byte chunks uh, translate to a 12 byte of actual key parameters. RSA keys are stored uh, with these parameters in uh, in the in the uh, PEM format, but uh, here we are interested in P and Q, which are the prime numbers uh, that are generated for the private key. So. We unfortunately don't get the entire P or Q. If we recover the entire P or Q, the RSA key is broken, but we only leak chunks of P and chunks of Q. But thanks to a technique uh, invented by Copper Smith, uh, we know that if we only uh, know one third of the one third of the bits of P plus Q, we can recover the rest of the key from this. So how does this work? We attach the, these key segments together, and when we have one third of this uh, P or Q, we can actually create an n-dimensional hidden number problem where n is relative to the number of recovered chunks. And by fitting this to a lattice-based algorithm, we can uh, find the uh, short vector and recover an entire P. We, mon we demonstrated this attack on a 1024 bit RSA key, but we also discussed how the same attack is possible on a bigger key sizes with a more complex uh, formulation. 
we reported uh, this uh, initial finding to Intel in June 2019. After a while, when they tried the issue, they mentioned that right combining operation uses field buffer, and this also matches one of the uh, one of their embodiment in 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 the patent regarding right combining operation. So, in conclusion, uh, automated testing for CPU attacks is important. It helps us to understand the root cause of these issues better. Uh, we can also use it to verify hardware mitigation, and also it can help us to improve the leakage rate and understand the impact of these attacks better. But is it really true that we can find if a new hardware has proper mitigation? Intel at some point sent us a new ISLEC CPU after uh, the November release of MDS. And ISLEC CPU was claimed at the time that it has mitigation against MDS in the hardware. So it's fundamentally secure against these attacks. Uh, but a couple of months ago, while I was stuck at home due to pandemic, I ran Transinter on ISLEC. And after some tests, I realized that none of the attacks work anymore, except uh, that Transinter managed to generate a variant of a store buffer data sampling. I looked at closer at the POC, and it turns out that the POC is a store buffer leakage due to 4K aliasing, but also because of the cache modification and putting the store address to a modified state, uh, the leakage also happens faster. I reported this issue into the Intel. They completed the triage in May, and they asked us for an embargo until July. Uh, in the discussion I had with the en engineer, they mentioned that the mitigation for ISLEC CPU was partially disabled due to some uh, chicken bits. And apparently OEMs also have shipped the ISLEC with the wrong microcode, so Intel needed some time until July to make sure OEMs and customers have enough time to mitigate this issue by updating the, their microcode version. So this shows that our tool transfer actually works and it's useful for testing if a new CPU is vulnerable to MDS attack. I also did some investigative work and wrote a report about this issue and, and we can see what microcodes are vulnerable and what are, are secure. Intel also updated the MDS advisory to include the ISLEC CPU. This is the end of my talk. Uh, there are some GitHub links here uh, to the tool and the ISLEC finding and I would be happy to take questions.